Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Folks and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans-style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Hello, I'm Chef John Folks. Food is so much more than nutrition here in the South. Every weekend on Louisiana's Back Roads and Bayous, our festivals celebrate the food, music, and cultures that make us unique. Why not join me as we visit the fairs and festivals of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. The Africans arrived against their will in Louisiana over 200 years ago, and since then, their contributions to our cultures have been immeasurable. Music and arts, politics, science are but three examples of this tremendous influence. This weekend in Southwest Louisiana, a festival commemorates the African-American culture. Welcome to Lake Charles, Louisiana, and to the Black Heritage Festival. There's no doubt about it, the single most important element in one's life is a clear understanding of heritage and our ancestors' contribution to mankind. Most people will agree we should begin by teaching our children. The Black Heritage Festival was founded in 1987 and provides the people of Louisiana with the opportunity to participate and gain knowledge of the African Americans who contributed so much to our Louisiana food, music, and culture. At this event, one will find historical displays created by the children from area schools, which culminates a month of studies dedicated to the African American cultures in Louisiana and the nation. In addition to jazz and zydeco artists, a highlight of this weekend is a performance by the New Orleans group Kumbuka African Drum and Dance Collective. Kumbuka is the Swahili word for remember. Here they perform the harvest dance, asking the creator for an abundant harvest and success with all of their crops. The group entertained with numerous dances of celebration and took time in between performances to teach the children simple phrases in the Swahili language and instill in audience pride in the African-American culture. Learning the meanings of these dance movements were of extreme interest to all. Over the three-day festival held at the Lake Charles Civic Center, visitors may view numerous exhibit booths, take part in the stay-in-school seminar, or experience the many heritage displays. There's a fashion show, essay contest, and the Heritage Achievement Award Ceremony. Although there's not much food associated with the festival other than a great cookbook, there's a whole lot of music. A gospel concert featuring the New Emanuel Baptist Church Choir and the Gospel Soul Seekers play it to a sellout audience. Regardless of ancestry, regardless of race, the Black Heritage Festival is guaranteed to give all of us a much better understanding of a culture who sacrificed more than most to the success of our nation and certainly to Louisiana. Wow, what a festival at the Lake Charles Civic Center. Of over the three, four, five hundred food festivals here in Louisiana, I can think of no festival that's more needed than the Black Heritage Festival. What a culture, what a contribution that they gave to not only Louisiana, but of course to the nation. And that's what this festival is all about. So you really need to get to Lake Charles and take part in that festival. Now, you know, what, what are some of the foods associated with it? There's so many different foods that we can trace back to the African culture, the African-American culture, the black heritage in uh, not only Louisiana, but the nation. When I think of Louisiana, I think of things like, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, okra, which is so famous in our gumbos and actually gave the, uh, the name of the soup, gumbo, from the African word for okra, yams. 
There's a lot of dispute about whether yams came from uh, South and Central America or did it come from Africa. Well, we certainly know that there was a root vegetable in Africa that came over with the slaves and certainly was uh, in the family of the yam or the sweet potato. Watermelon seeds, black-eyed peas, all types of beans, certainly we can attribute all the way back to Africa and a big part of our food today, not only in Louisiana, as I say, but the rest of the country as well. I'm sauteing some seven steaks here, but I'm going to have a, a, a platter of them right here on the counter because I want you to look at these, and I'm going to season these little seven steaks. You can see the seven right down the middle of the steaks. These are one of the most important meats that would have been cooked almost daily, especially after the 1850s, the Civil War, in many of the African-American homes and certainly in the Cajun and Creole homes. Uh, this is, uh, most people call it a blade steak. It's right under the shoulder, right before the shoulder roast, and right before the shank. It's the front shoulder of the beef. A really nice piece of meat, it takes a long time to braise it, but braising brings out the flavor in the seven steak. Fact is, this is one of the dishes that my guest today, uh, Kathy Hambrick, is the director of the African-American Museum and Gallery over at Tess Cuco Plantation, and she is not only an authority on the culture, she is doing something that you will really be inspired by, and to think that here's a woman from corporate America, African American, leaving her job, volunteering, not a cent coming to her pocket to not only preserve the African American culture, but at the same time inspire us to know a little bit about it. She's going to be the guest on the show today, and she's going to be in the kitchen, and we're going to talk about this and eat it after. So, well, you're going to love her when she comes in. Kathy Hambrick. I'm going to season the, season the seven steaks a little salt. Of course, you know, use your imagination, you know, that a little pepper, a little granulated garlic. I like garlic, and kind of press it into those seven steaks. Any meat that takes a long time to braise, in my opinion, is some of the better meats, but at the same time, the less expensive. So naturally, we would have seen some of these in the homes that couldn't afford the ribeyes, the prime ribs, the filet mignons. These are the types of cuts that certainly would have been found in any African-American home. Now, I have some, as you know, sauteing in that skillet. So once they're all seasoned like this, take a look in this skillet, and you're going to see what they look like when they're all fired up. And you can see that they're, they're kind of tough at this point because we're sauteing them, getting that nice brown color in. This is similar to round steak. You want to make sure that you brown them well first in a little bit oil, and then you're going to come in with all of your seasonings. We're going to put in some onions, naturally, celery, bell pepper. All of these things would have been available uh, to any African-American or Cajun or Creole in the city of New Orleans. All of these nice vegetables, after all, semi-tropical climate, we have a good growing season here. The gardens were certainly full of wonderful seasonings like this. And garlic. Garlic grew wild here, so we're going to put a lot of garlic in here. You can even uh, uh, put a little bit flour on top of these if you want to before you saute them because the flour will add a little bit thickening to the sauce. And that's always very important to kind of thicken it. However, traditionally, we don't flour uh, these. But you see how nice it looks with all of those great colors in here. You can put potatoes, carrots, all of these wonderful things. Go to your butcher and tell the butcher to cut you a set of seven steaks or blade steaks. I'm going to add the beef stock. You can use water. Certainly, you can use water. You want to braise these, which means that you're going to cook them slowly with a cover on top, either on top of the stove for about two hours or in the oven. You want to put them in the oven at about 350 degrees and these are going to be magnificent when they're tender, falling off the bone. In fact, I have some already done. I want to show you what these great seven steaks look like. Just get a shot of that platter right here because these are really, really nice. You can see how tender they are. And even though they're a less expensive cut of meat, I can think of no meat more flavorful than the seven steaks or blade steaks right from any neighborhood butcher. In fact, I just went down to a little store and had them cut these for me this morning. They're absolutely fantastic. Seven steaks from the Black Heritage Festival in Lake Charles. The next dish I want to do for you is just as important in the African culture as those seven steaks or blade steaks. In fact, a lot more important to them and to the nation. You're going to see in this platter, I have an example of one of the most important beans that came to us from Africa. This little pea here is the black-eyed pea. 
Now, they call it Congri. However, you know of the chickpeas, you know of all of the other peas that were so important as a protein to the Africans when they came here to, the, uh, uh, to America. So beans were an important part of their diet. What I like about these is they have uh, they've found their way onto every American table. Everybody on January 1st, New Year's Day, sits to a little pot of these black-eyed peas for good luck. And if it wasn't for the African-Americans, forget about it. They wouldn't even be here. Now, they're normally cooked with different types of smoked meats. We have, uh, uh, here's some typical meats. Again, you have to remember, this is on a plantation, so the smoke uh, smoked neck bones. These are neck bones from beef or pork. Uh, here we have uh, some of the raw, the neck bones. Again, there's meat on it. The bones give a really good stock. Of course, the fat, very important um, uh, in a diet way back then. Uh, smoked hocks. This is the pig feet, pig, uh, pig hock, the shank, that smoked over pecan wood or hickory wood. Really, really nice flavor and it preserved the meat as well. So this would have been found in, uh, in most of these dishes. Smoked sausage, lesser cuts, undesirable cuts to the main house in many ways as far as the Africans were concerned, and the origin of a lot of our soul cooking. Here you have the pig's tail. And I tell you, I don't know how many people eat pig's tail today, but it was a major part of that diet. And of course, bacon and any, any other thing, any little scrap, that's where soul cooking originated by taking those scraps into the kitchen. So I'm going to go ahead and, and cook some of these, but I want to show you this little tool here. I think it's an important little tool when we talk about the African Americans or the black heritage uh, of Louisiana. This is a, a scraper that when you talk about the boucherie or, the, or the, the making of hams and sausages at slaughter time for pigs, this would have been in the hands of every African uh, pulling the hide or the, or the the bristle off of the pig, a very important tool uh, in their life. So I've got all of these meats. I've had my little black iron pot here. I want to fire that up. I have a little fat, a little lard, a little uh, shortening. Of course, you can put a little vegetable spray if you want to stay away from fat. This is a fatty dish. Or you can just put smoked turkey sausage or smoked turkey ham in here. But I'm going to go ahead in this little pot. I'm going to add some... Uh, I'm going to kick this fire up here and I add a little bit of the smoked uh, neck bone, which is really going to give it a good flavor. Again, you can put a little bacon in it or just leave the bacon out. I'm going to put the ham hock down in here. This will start to add that nice smoked flavor to it. And then I can put some of these, a uh, little piece of this sausage down in here. Now, once all of this sautés for just a minute or so to add the smoked flavor, I'm going to add again the very simple flavors, the onions, the celery, the bell pepper. I cook red beans this way. I cook white beans this way. I cook black-eyed peas like the congri here. This way, just add whatever vegetables you would like. And certainly, the garlic. You can add garlic pods or you can... But again, let your own flavorings matter here, not so much mine. Once all of these saute nicely, then I'm going to add the black-eyed peas. I have some that's been soaking in water overnight because it tenderizes them. It cuts about a third off of the cooking time, so soak all of your dried beans overnight, change the water out, and then go ahead and put them down into the pot. The wonderful little black-eyed peas right there. Stir them in, kind of blend them well into the flavors, and then you want to add water, stock. You can add chicken stock. I'm going to add just a nice hot water so we keep the cooking process going here. And then you want to add your salt, your pepper, your green onions, whatever flavors you really like to season all of your beans with. I'm going to put a little salt, a little pepper, just kind of stir that around. Add some green onions, parsley to it. It's going to really put a nice look to it. Plus, of course, the flavor is just going to be incredible. Now, I would allow these to cook. This, you want this to cook for about an hour and a half to two hours to get a nice, tender, uh, bean, you want to smash it against the side of the pot as they cook to kind of get that nice creamy effect. And this is what they look like. After they come out of that pot, oh, an hour or so, an hour and a half, this is what they're going to look like when they hit the table. Look at that nice ham hock right in the center. Put the smoked sausage around it if you'd like and kind of get all those flavors mingling and marrying together. I can think of no better dish or no dish associated more with the African Americans in this country than black eyed peas, unless watermelon on July 4th, because they also brought the seeds of that wonderful fruit here to Louisiana. Okay, now a couple other dishes. 
associated with the Black Heritage Festival. Uh, right here, a little yam bread. Take a look at this. This would go right onto the table, uh, and the yam is baked right into the bread. Of course, we have uh, this. I love this. You, you know it as cod cake or salmon cake. This, in fact, is catfish cakes mixed with potatoes. We use garfish. We use buffalo fish. Remember, the Africans in Louisiana were right on the river, right on the river road. They could go right into the Mississippi and get fish, and this would have been a major part of that diet, so a very important part of the African culture. Now, I have to tell you, I told you about Kathy Hambrick, the director of the River Road African American Museum and Gallery, and she is a wonderful lady. You're going to love her to death. How are you doing? Hi, John. How are you doing? Give me a hug here. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Now, what are you doing? Trying to put me to work here with this? What is this? Yeah, we're going to put you out in cane fields today. <laughs> <laughs> this is a canice. Uh, boy, I tell you, a lot of African hands on this tool, huh? Yes, yes, lots of African hands touched cane knives in this country. Uh, you know, the sugar industry is the large, just about the largest industry in Louisiana, and uh, and here this uh, this knife is no more associated with that industry or the Africans. Probably the most significant tool mm -hmm. to the African Americans in Louisiana. What about the black bow? Well, you know, you think about cutting cane, and and to have a knife of this sort in your hand would create blisters if you used it all day long. And you can see on this knife, someone tied this rag to prevent the blisters right, from coming right. in their hand. And I have people along the River Road who bring things to my museum, um, artifacts, actually. And I have a collection of cane knives, and this came from um, a man who lives on the River Road. Well, great. Well, hey, I tell you, is this for me, or it's going back to the museum? It's going back to the museum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had a few of these in my hand. I'm going to just put these, uh, this right down here. I love this dress. Now, tell me about it. Well, we have friends of the museum, and whenever they travel to Africa, they bring something back to the museum. And this was a gift from one of my board members that brought this back from Ghana. Oh, it's beautiful, just beautiful. So well, you can see the fabric and I, the embroidery. It, it, and and I, I tell you, I hate to ask you to cook with that on it because I, I should have about three aprons on top of there. <laughs> but remember the last time we were talking, we talked about the Liz's, that little bitty simple cookie mm -hmm. uh, that was made all over the South and certainly on the plantations and many African hands whipped up this batter. I want you to help me with it so we can show everybody what the Lizzie is all about. Okay. Uh, very, very simple cookie. Uh, and you know, it, it, uh, candied fruit is a major part of what goes into it. And candied fruit would have mm -hmm. been available to the Africans. I say candied fruit, fruit, mm -hmm. dried fruit mm -hmm. in general, right? Right, right. Why don't you whip that up for me? I have some eggs, uh, shortening, a little bit brown sugar, and sugar certainly on the plantations would have been available, right? This would have right. been typical, typical dishes. Now, once that all whips, I want to show everybody what's on this little platter right next to it here because I have uh, some uh, candied fruit. This right here is, uh, well, I don't know, cherries and raisins that have been soaked in a little bourbon or brandy. Here we have a little bit of uh, uh, cherries. Now, these there were, were wild blue cherries in Louisiana, so wild purple cherries, so mm -hmm. they would have candied those. Uh, flour, of course, a lot of flour available. Pecans, we had pecans everywhere, so they were available. And then any other flavorings that would go into the pot. So I'm going to add all of these into the dish real fast, and these would decorate the top of the cookie, but I'm going to throw these in. Pecans mm -hmm. and uh, flour, and of course you would just make a very thin batter. You can whip that in. I'm going to keep that off of your dress there. Right. <laughs> you would whip those in and make a nice stiff batter, and the good thing about that uh, dish right there is that it would be baked, just the kids could throw it onto a cookie sheet, it would go into an oven at 350 degrees, for about 15, 20 minutes, and that, that's enough whipping okay. because I think everybody has the idea. <laughs> and right. I want to show everybody what it looks like. Take a look at that nice uh, little platter of lizards right there. And Kathy, why don't you sit down while we have those, uh, everybody's looking at those. I might eat one of those later. And let's talk a little bit, not only about the museum, but about uh, the African-American culture. You know, when, when people start to talk about slavery, in general, oh my God, everybody heads for the doors and they forget that it was a part of this nation that we have to remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, where, where did the African slaves that came to Louisiana, where did they come from? And more importantly, why did they come? Well, many of the Africans that were brought to Louisiana came from the Senegambia area of West Africa. That's a region known as Senegal and Gambia. And they were brought here to Louisiana around 1709. And they were brought here not just for manual labor purposes, but they, they were agriculturalists, 
uh, iron workers, um, and because of their special skills, um, not just for manual labor purposes. So, so what you're saying is a slave trader would have known the slaves that they were bringing over or would have at least scouted to find out oh, if yeah. there was a talent? Oh, definite, definitely. Uh, in Senegal, for instance, rice was being cultivated for, for hundreds of years prior to the slave traders going there prior to 1709. And they observed the cultivation of rice in Senegal. And so they, 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 they brought, brought rice, brought, brought barrels of rice here. And brought and, their, well, until you decided that uh, some efforts needed to be put forth to preserve the culture, or at least tell the story, was there any efforts in Louisiana, the South, the nation, to, uh, to have a museum of, your, of, of the type of the African American Heritage Museum? Well, this is the only museum of this type here in Louisiana. Uh, at Thomas Jefferson's home, they're making some efforts to do interpretation of the slave community uh, there. Also, Williamsburg in Virginia, they're doing interpretation there about the slave culture. But here in Louisiana, I'm the only one, the only African American that's making an attempt to tell the story of our people on the River Road. Why, why you? I mean, there's uh, African American college presidents, there's bankers. Uh, you were a, a, a woman from corporate America who, why, why did you do it? Well, I think that it's been a spiritual um, awakening for me since I came back to Louisiana. Um, I visited several plantations when I came back here. And I found that the story of the black people who worked in the fields, who contributed to the economy of this country by working in the sugarcane fields, the story was not being told when you go on the plantation tours. A lot of talk about the antiques, the furniture, uh, but no mention of the black people who actually built some of those great houses, as they are called. And I uh, really lost sleep at night, and I said, you know, there must be something that I can do to tell the story of the contributions of the people who work so hard to build this country. And that's what I do at the museum. What, what, what about the, the museum? What, what people do you depict there? And really, what is the message? Well, um, what the, the story that I tell at the museum, of course, as you mentioned before, slavery is a subject that we just don't like to talk about here in America. But I find that by not looking at some of the pain and suffering we don't get a chance to see some of the, the contributions that were made. And in doing some research on uh, slavery at one of the plantations, the homeless house, I ran across some information about a man named Pierre Calis Landry, who was once enslaved at the homeless house. Well, three years after emancipation, he was elected as the first black mayor of the town of Donisonville in 1868. And then through further research, I found out that Pierre Landry was actually the first African-American mayor elected to any town in this whole country. And he was once enslaved in Ascension Parish. Gee, that's a, I, and you uncover that uh, alone. That's what a story that is. In fact, because I'm from Donaldsonville, and I have to tell you, I didn't, I didn't know it. And I think I know, I at least try to know the culture really well. What's the reaction from other plantations? Is anybody picking up the message and saying, hey, we need to do this as well? Well, there are a few uh, plantations that are, are now, um, I think, considering doing interpretation. A Laura plantation down in Vachery uh, is telling the story of the Singalese who, who built the house, the Creole-style plantation down there, and also, um, um, but not, not enough is being done to tell the full story. And I think that it's left up to African Americans, it's left up to us to tell the story from our perspective. And that's why I'm so dedicated to doing, to doing this project. Well, well, I know the museum is basically off of the ground. Tess Cuco Plantation near Donaldsonville has uh, uh, given you the space. I know you do it on your, on your own. There's no dollars. It's, it, it's a work, a, a labor of love, as you say. Uh, where's the money going to come from? Well, the money's going to come, I'm sure, from uh, people around the country, people around the world who feel that this is a worthwhile project. Uh, we have a lot of industry in our area. We're in the, uh, the petrochemical corridor on the river road between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And I'm really looking for the support of, of corporate America to come and help us to try to preserve what's left of the history of the African American people who live in the communities along the river road. You know, I saw an African proverb. In fact, it's in your museum. 
and it's uh, printed across the front of your brochure, and it's absolutely fantastic. It says that until the lion writes his own story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Are you the lion? Probably so. What a message. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy, for coming and sharing that with us. I know that the museum has a great future, and I'll do whatever I can for it, certainly. And thanks for your fabulous efforts. And thank all of you for stopping by today and visiting with us as we cook up foods of the fairs and festivals. And come back again as we continue to cook up more great taste of Louisiana. We're going to eat Liz's here. Oh, great, <laughs> hey, great. thank you so much. Hey, look. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans-style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. This is PBS. The companion cookbook to A Taste of Louisiana is available for $19.95. Chef John Fultz's Louisiana Sampler features recipes and history behind Louisiana's fairs and festivals. The cookbook contains 130 recipes, including those from this show, and over 26 full-color photographs. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.